Hello, and welcome to the Collider Podcast. I'm Collider Senior Editor Matt Goldberg, and with me is Managing Editor Adam Chitwood. Howdy, folks. Today, we'll be talking about the films and shows of Aaron Sorkin. His newest film, Trial of the Chicago 7, hit Netflix last Friday. So we figured we'd talk about that film, but use it as an opportunity to talk about his whole filmography and sort of the strengths and weaknesses of Sorkin's writing and his his worldview, if you will. So uh, I'm actually going to let Adam sort of guide this one. He wrote this great article on the side, ranking all of uh, Aaron Sorkin's movies, where he's been involved as either a writer or a director. Um, so take it away, Adam. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I've been I've been a pretty huge Sorkin fan for quite a long time. Uh, and I was kind of curious just to start off, like, what was your introduction to Sorkin? What was the first thing of his that you saw that you were like, Did, oh, and now I know who Aaron Sorkin is and now? Yeah, that would have been West Wing for me. I mean, I had seen A Few Good Men before that. Yeah. Um, but I didn't like, a, in, in my mind, I was like, oh, it's a Rob Reiner film. It wasn't like, I didn't like put two and two together. Like it's really Aaron Sorkin's voice. He adapted his own play to make that, you know, for that film. Um, so it was really West Wing. It's like, oh, this, this is who this Aaron Sorkin guy is. And that especially became true when he left the West Wing at the end of season four and the show like became, felt completely different without him. Yeah. Yeah, I I was the same way. Like, I had seen A Few Good Men. I had seen The American President. But I didn't catch up to the West Wing until college. Like, it had been off the air for, like, a year or two by the time I started watching it. A friend had, like, the DVDs, and this was before the age of Netflix, and I started watching it and became obsessed with it. And then also noticed there's a very significant tone shift between seasons four and five that happens. Um, but, I yeah, I mean, he... I mean, the guy gets ragged on a ton, but I, I think <laughs> we have to like, I don't know. It's funny because like he gets ragged on a lot, but he is also kind of inarguably one of the best writers. Like, oh, he, today. He, he, the thing is, is like he is sort of he, he is a really good writer and he but he's also very enamored of the profession of writing, as you can see yeah. from West Wing. Um but no, he is like, he's a good writer. He worked, he studied, I think he was a protege to William Goldman. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he he honed his skills. Like he, his writing is legit. The problem is sort of like, I guess the, the best analogy is like, he has like a souped up sports car, but he doesn't know always how, how to drive it. Like the machinery yeah. is there. It's top of the line. What you do with it is the question. And that's where, it, that's where Sorkin's sort of voice becomes debatable. Because the nuts and bolts yeah. are, are 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 sort of pristine. Yeah, and he kind of hit fully formed. Like, A Few Good Men was a play, and I think before it even got to Broadway, they had scooped up the movie rights, and he was working on writing a screenplay for it for Rob Reiner and Castle Rock Entertainment. Uh, and that film came out in 1992. Courtroom drama, Tom Cruise, Jack Nicholson, Demi Moore, uh, Kevin Bacon, just like an incredible cast for like his first ever movie and kind of that pitter patter. And like, it came around when I can't remember if the firm was like directly after that, but like these kinds of like paperback thrillers were really yeah, in vogue the, around that yeah, time. A few good men was 92. The firm is 93, I believe. Okay. So it came like right after. And like the nineties were full of thrillers like this, where I don't know, like it's hard to describe, but like, you know, the score to a few good men, like, you, you know, like that music, against like a bunch of other different films and you had a, a an actor like tom cruise but a few good men it, i don't know it felt different and i think that's largely due in part to sorkin's script i mean it's he jokes about like uh he turned in the script and they were like aaron you have to have some kind of action scene like these are just people talking in rooms and so we write it wrote a scene where tom cruise's character steps outside to get lunch and that's his action scene <laughs> and that's like really the only like exterior kind of shot so it's kind of remarkable if you go back and watch it there's really not a ton of filler and it's just compelling from beginning to end yeah no i mean it, it really works i i love it it's, to me it's a film i can watch any time um but it also sort of stresses that and and we'll come back around to this when we get to chicago seven that sorkin is a very firm believer in institutions like he like that's sort of the thing is that sorkin is not an outsider figure and i don't think he's really ever related to that despite sort of i think probably feeling that way with you know wrestling with drug abuse um which he has you know admitted to and and says and knows that that's one of his personal struggles and, and has made it part of his art with characters who deal with substance abuse but for Sorkin, he still looks at institutions as 
as inherently good. So when you get so for something like a few good men, yes, you have bad actors like Colonel Jessup and uh, Kiefer Sutherland's character and things like that. But ultimately, a, a small group of well-intentioned people working hard can make the difference. And that's something he keeps returning to is that a small group of well-intentioned people who are smart and work hard can change the tide. And that's that's a core belief of, of an Aaron Sorkin film. Yeah, and it's kind of, I don't know, for me, as a, like a bit of a romantic, I that's something that really attracts me. But I also, as the years go on, you can see kind of the the failures in, in that mindset. Um, and then at the same time that he was working on Few Good Men, he was working on a script called Malice, which was an idea. I think William Goldman came up with the idea and like it was like an assignment asking Sorkin to write it. And from what I understand is Sorkin wrote like the script and then was called back to go work on a few good men to finish up that script. And Scott Frank came in and wrote on malice. So malice is one of only two films on Sorkin's resume where he's not the sole credited writer. Therefore, I don't think we can necessarily call malice an Aaron Sorkin film. And it's one that he admits now he's pretty ashamed of uh, for a variety of reasons, but it's an absolutely crazy movie. It's pretty bonkers. Do you want it's to describe insane. the plot of Malice? Can I describe the plot <laughs> of Malice? <laughs> I mean, uh, so ostensibly, uh, Bill Pullman plays a professor uh, who ended up marrying one of his students, played by Nicole Kidman, and their life is upended when a hotshot we had the cross pass with a hotshot doctor played by Alec Baldwin, who it turns out used to go to school with high school with Bill Pullman. And Alec Baldwin's character was like the jock. Um, and then a medical emergency happens to Nicole, to Nicole Kidman's character. And Alec Baldwin's character ends up taking out her ovaries. Like he has to make a call very quickly, like can't consult with the pathologist. And he ends up making the wrong call. He ends up taking out a healthy ovary and chaos ensues. But like, if you told me that Aaron Sorkin and Scott Frank were writing the script and then every 20 pages, like, M. Night Shyamalan came in and said, now this happens, and then make it happen, I, like, I would believe you because it changes every 20 minutes. Like, it's a different movie. I will just, for people who are like, oh, well, how crazy is Malice? I will say that the climax of the film turns on a child CPR dummy. <laughs> yes, it does. And then there's another twist at the very end that you're just like, what? <laughs> the very last shot of the movie, you're like, what? Where did that come from? Yeah. Uh, it's an entirely forgettable movie, save for one speech that Alec Baldwin's character gives. Yeah. Where and it's on YouTube. Just go watch it on YouTube. Yeah. Type in Alec Baldwin, I am God. And watch yeah, it. I will say, speaking of Alec Baldwin, I am bummed that we never got the we were supposed to get a few good men live with Alec Baldwin playing Jessa and that That's never right. happened. And I don't know if, I don't think it's ever going to happen now. Yeah. I can't remember. They announced it like four years ago. Yeah. I can't so. remember what happened with that. If that felt like, cause NBC has been asking for Sorkin to do something West Wing related for forever. That felt mm -hmm. like maybe they were trying to, <laughs> and then now HBO <laughs> and Max he said, I will for HBO Max <laughs> Yeah, for water media. Cause Warner Brothers television owns it. Um, yeah, I don't know what happened with that, but that would have been fun because A Few Good Men was also restaged in London. After Sorkin left the West Wing, he went and um, helped shepherd that with Rob Lowe uh, playing the lead role. So, yeah, I don't know. That would have been cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> go ahead. No, no, so after Malice, you get American President, correct? Yeah, which is yeah, I... quintessential Sorkin. I think. Yes, it's also proto-West Wing. You can sort of yeah. see shades of certain characters inhabiting these other characters in uh, American president. Yeah. Uh, an Amer American president is just, it's a romantic comedy set in the world of politics. It's Michael Douglas is the president, but he's a widower, uh, strikes up a relationship with a lobbyist played by Annette Benning, which now I'm like, if someone pitched that movie today, they'd be like, no, 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 we're not doing that. Uh, it's, from, it's from a more innocent time. I mean, it could really only be made in 95 yeah. Yeah. as sort of almost like a tonic because I think in 93, Three primary colors had come out, um, which was sort of eviscerating to the to the Clinton administration. And like even before the Clinton administration was around, like people were like, oh, like Bill Clinton's a Lothario. He cheats on his wife. And like, you know, 
we just all have to kind of live with it. Um, but the nineties were also like a booming economic time. So it's a lot happier time. And it's also like, even though like, if you were getting into like sort of the nitty gritty of like politics, like politics was not like all sunshine and rainbows in the nineties. And I don't want to pretend that it was, but it was enough that like, you could create sort of this, you could create sort of a presidential hero. And you see that in not just, you know, uh, American president, but also independence day and deep impact. And like, you know, the president's going to get us through this. Yeah. Um, you could even, you know, you could even have like, or you could have something like in the line of fire. It's like where we must protect the president at all costs. Like that's the tension of the film. And the only film I can really think of from the nineties where it's like the president is a bad guy is absolute power. Oh yeah. I don't remember that one too well. Where like Clint, Clint Eastwood, like I think Gene Hackman's a president and he's involved in a murder and Clint Eastwood's a jewel thief who witnesses the murder. Um, I don't think the president, is, no, I don't think the president is a bad guy in Murder at 1600. Alan Alda is the bad guy in Murder at 1600, but I don't, I don't think, think he's so. the president. But I do think it speaks to something that, like, throughout the 90s, it was just like, yeah, just cast a, you know, just whatever white dude as president, like, they'll buy it. Like, nowadays, like, like politics were not, granted, I was much younger, but politics were not as all-encompassing as they are today, especially with social media and everything. So it was very easy to, like, there were people who paid attention to politics and people who didn't. And for people who didn't, they felt like it didn't really affect their everyday life. And like, yeah, you didn't have to sort of make it the main character of your life every day, which is again, sort of the white privileged position, which again, it's sort of Sorkin's bread and butter. <laughs> so yeah. like, so I think like American president, like it's very well intentioned and I think it's very charming and I love it. Um, but I also think it is sort of like, it can have this sort of romanticized view of politics um, where all it takes to really, crush Bob Rumson is a good speech. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like he just gets up, has like, an elo like, and again, like that's Sor Sorkin is a writer who loves writing. And so like eloquence is such a major, like, you know, tool in his arsenal that if you get a president who's eloquent and then speaks about the nature of America, like that's like, like the American president doesn't end with, um, and he won reelection. It's like, no, 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 this speech is so good. We don't even need to show you that he wins re-election. <laughs> yes. That's how good this speech is. But you buy it because it's a yeah. damn good speech. And like Douglas really sells the hell out of the Sorkin mm -hmm. line. I think Douglas is a real, like there are actors who you can tell struggle with Sorkin stuff, but then there are actors who are like, oh yeah, this is really like in lockstep. And I think Douglas really gets it and really, because it's comedy. There's so much comedy in Sorkin's writing yeah. and, and that it's too underplaying is, is, it. Yeah. Is, is excellent. I mean, it's, it's just, I think from top to bottom, the film works. Yeah. It's super fun uh, and super nice and very nostalgic. It feels like you're watching something from an alien planet <laughs> at this point. It is. And, you know, again, I don't want to be like, oh, up until recently, you couldn't have, you know, all politics films were nice. Like, no, I mean, I mean, Mr. Smith goes to Washington is very cynical. It's yeah. like we all remember like the, the filibuster speech, but the whole point is like he's giving it because there's so much corruption around him. Mm -hmm. um, so this notion, like, I don't want to like, you know, smooth things over, but for its part and for its time, American president is very uplifting and hopeful. And again, you can sort of see that carry over to the West Wing. And it holds up. Like, I know you've watched yeah. it fairly recently. And I, watched I watched it, it yesterday. On... <laughs> <laughs> My wife wasn't feeling well. And so we're just like, I, so I, was, I was looking after her and like, we're just like, do you just want to watch West Wing or not West Wing? You want to watch American president? And like, yeah. And so we did. And it was great. <laughs> I watched it on my birthday this year and I was like, it's just so nice. Like, it's very, it's a very nice movie. Yeah. Um, and so uh, then, so first Sorkin did Sports Night, which is his first foray into television, inspired by kind of his obsession with ESPN. Uh, and Sports Night was a half hour, ostensibly a sitcom on NBC. ABC. ABC. Uh, with Peter Krause and Josh Charles and Tay Leone. Tay Leone? Nope. Uh, oh, everyone's Felicity favorite. Huffman. Felicity Huffman. That's it. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's been a while, but that show like and it's been a long time since I revisited it. I liked it. I didn't watch it when it was on, or maybe I watched some of it when it was on. Um, but it, you can feel like it's very much like early TV Sorkin. Like it's him trying to get into the groove of like how to write a TV show and how to make his soaring speeches not feel like they just like bring everything to a halt in the it's middle also, of a half hour. 
it's also straining against the format. It's like yes. so weird. It's like, hey, you know this guy who's known for dramas and like has like sort of pitter patter dialogue and like long speeches. Let's give him a half hour sitcom yeah. with a laugh track. Like the first seat, the second season of Sports Night does not have a laugh track, but the first season does, and it's very weird to hear laugh track responding to Sorkin dialogue. Yes. Yeah, and. I don't know. I like I haven't watched it in forever, but it and it only ran for two seasons. Um, because I rewatched it probably like maybe ten years ago, eight years ago, mm. some somewhere around there. It was it's on it's hard to find. It's not on yeah. any streamer, which is surprising considering like, I mean, yeah, Felicity Huffman isn't exactly you know a, a glowing name right now, but people still like Peter Krause. He was on he was Pound Parenthood, and like yeah. Josh Charles was Good Wife. Like everyone, like these are not actors who like disappeared and were never heard from again. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't really know how to re- recommend it to people because I don't know how they'd find it other than just buying the DVDs. Um, but I do think, you know, I think there's a reason West Wing sticks out. And West Wing started during the second season of Sports Night. So Sorkin famously wrote every script of every episode of Sports Night and every script of every episode of the West Wing that he worked on. And the West Wing was born out of the American president. So the original draft for the American president was way too long. And all the stuff he cut out was all the stuff with the senior staff of the president. And so he decided to make a TV show about that senior staff. Initially, the president was only going to be in one of every four episodes. But when they cast Martin Sheen, it was like, oh, well, clearly he's going to be in this more. Um, and he just worked so well. Because if you go back and watch the pilot for the West Wing, like the president comes in at the very end as like a kind of a grand entrance, but is not necessarily a central figure to it. Um, and yeah, I adore the West Wing. <laughs> I know that it's not cool to like it. I mean, I wrote about this when I wrote about the special I, I mean, it's my favorite TV show of all time for all its failures, for all its romanticism, for all its heightened whatever. I just think pound for pound, it's just so enjoyable and hopeful um, and, you know, maybe blindly optimistic. But sometimes that optimism is nice. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is like, is the West Wing flawed? Yes, absolutely. Even even in it, even if you're like saying it's positives, like there's weird, like especially in its first season, there are weird episodes like, you know, where sort of the paternalism of Sorkin kind of creeps in. And mm-hmm. it's, you know, again, I, if, if you have qualms with the West Wing, I guarantee you I've heard them and I, I, I'm not even going to necessarily refute them, but I also think the show like pound for pound works as well as anything and is different from most other things. I mean, nowadays it's like, yeah, you know, you have a show like Scandal set on the hill or something like that. But like West Wing was unique for its time to like, oh no, just, this is a what like it's going to take place in the White House. You know, like this is like how and like we're going to give you a a hopeful view of politics. Um, And I think that that matters. And I I mean, I especially felt it on that West Wing special. Like I was like, yes, this is what this is what I want. Give me the good stuff. (laughs) I, you know, at some point you have to sort of allow yourself to feel joy. And it's like it's not the fact that these criticisms are irrelevant or you or you're like saying, oh, just let people enjoy things. But also at the same, like, let yourself enjoy something. Let your do it for yourself. Not as a matter of, you know, silencing discourse, but just a matter of appreciating something rather than, you know, sort of being uh, overwhelmed by its flaws. And talk about, I mean, I guess, save from Moira Kelly, who didn't make it past the first season, <laughs> but that entire ensemble is pitch perfect and they get it like they get in lockstep with that Sorkin dialogue and I think because they were doing it so often and for so long um, like they were doing routinely like 12 13 14 hour days uh, like their whole thing was that you know when they went into work on Friday they knew they weren't leaving and they would never leave before the sun was up on Saturday and this was due in large part to the fact that Sorkin was writing every script himself and he was very late on a lot of those scripts um but they kind of like, I mean, the cast admits like they put up with it because it was that good. Like it, it wasn't like, if it was late and like the scripts were falling short, it would be one thing. But like you were getting something like in Excelsis Deo. Um, and and was, like, yeah. And people have to remember, like this is West Wing is a product of its time. I mean, we're like, oh, how could you be turning scripts in late? Well, you try doing 22 episodes, 22 yeah. hour long episodes in, in a year. Like if the West Wing had. And, and the thing is, is I think like if you were to reboot the West Wing today which I don't think is a terrible idea. But if you were to reboot it today, like it'd be on HBO and it'd be like, 
okay, 10 episode seasons. And like, they'd be done. And like, Sorkin would have the time to write them and they'd be done. And then they would just film them. Like, yeah. we get, like, how much, like, you get two years to make a season of Westworld and that shows garbage. <laughs> <laughs> And it was only eight episodes this season. It was only eight episodes, and it was still garbage. So, like, West Wing, it's like you build your little West Wing set. It's a lot cheaper because there's yeah. no special effects, really. And then you just have, like, you just cast great actors. Like, I think that would work a lot better. But, like, West Wing at the time was like, no, it's network television. You have to make us 22 episodes of The Thing. I'm not surprised he got burnt out after four years. Um, and it's, I think, you know, for NBC's part, maybe they should have, figured out some sort of leeway with him to sort of be like, you know, yeah. let's, I mean, I think for net for NBC, it's like this train cannot and Warner brothers television, like this train cannot stop moving and it will keep going with or without you. And I think that was a mistake. Yeah. And I think it also should be said, Thomas Schlamme was a huge, like he was Sorkin's close collaborator on his four seasons of the West wing. Thomas Schlamme created the visual language of the West wing, created the walk and talk. And Thomas Schlamme also worked on Sports Night, um, and he's still directing great episodes of television today. Uh, but yeah, as I understand it, what uh, what event, what actually happened was they were right, getting towards the end of season four, and they presented Sorkin with a contract for season five with very strict stipulations. You know, uh, scripts will be turned in by this time every day, and if they don't, there will be consequences. Budgets being cut, so you need to cut cast. Uh, we're cutting the amount of time you have to make the show, but not cutting the amount of episodes or anything like that. And Sorkin had been going through drug problems as well throughout the making of The West Wing. And so I think he, yeah, I think he just got burnt out and left. And, you know, it became a different show afterwards. I still think season five is pretty rough to get through. But after that, um, I think he just accepted it as a different show. It's John Wells' version of The West Wing. And I kind of dig season six and seven. I, I like the alternating episodes as it's uh, running through the election uh, and who's going to um, become the next president after Martin Sheen's character. I don't know. I think it, uh, I think there's definitely value in those final two seasons, but for me, pound for pound, there, pound, pound for pound, there's nothing better than those first four seasons. Can I share also one of my favorite West Wing stories, which yes. is that, so in the middle of season four, in a really clumsy way, Rob Lowe leaves the show. Oh, Yes. I so Rob Lowe, like, leaves the... I was like, why would Rob Lowe leave this show where he was, like, ostensibly, like, the lead actor? Well, when he signed on, he thought he'd be the lead actor, and it really became more of an ensemble, but he was okay with it for a while. And then NBC comes along, and it's like, hey, do you want to lead this show called The Lion's Den? <laughs> and you'll get to be, like, we're going to put a huge push behind it. Like, you will be the star of The Lion's Den. And he's like, I'm leaving to go do The Lion's Den. <laughs> and The Lion's Den aired like six episodes <laughs> and then they canceled it. But because they were contractually obligated to do 13 for the DVD, like the final episode, they were just like, whatever, let's just make them like a serial killer or something. <laughs> and you can watch the final scene. It makes no sense. It's hilarious. It's it's just no one gives a fuck. <laughs> and I just think for, for Rob Lowe to sort of leave the West Wing which was like, even even if after Sorgan left, like was still like not, it was still like a more reliable thing than the lion's den. Yeah. But that being said, if Rob Lowe doesn't leave the West Wing, does he eventually do Parks and Rec? And I don't know. I don't know how that history looks. Yeah, I don't either. And I think Rob Lowe has kind of become more candid about it in recent years. And like the best, the clearest explanation I've heard is that uh, he got some bad advice from like, he was listening to his talent agents, his managers telling him, you're bigger than this. You know, you're still top billing, but you're getting like, you know, two scenes an episode. You need to be starring in your own show. And he was like, you know what? You're right. It's time for me to leave. It's time to do the lion's den. Yeah. And the way Sorkin tells it and the reason that it's so strange when Sam leaves the show, because there is no big send off. It, it kind of just disappears. It's because Sorkin said he was hoping and praying every day that Rob would change his mind, that he would come back. And so he was trying to not make any kind of finality about it to yeah. make it so that Sam could just slip back in, that he was going to go and run this campaign and then he would be back afterwards. So. Yeah. I feel like again, it's sort of in an alternate universe where like Sorkin still like comes back for season five and NBC and like, they're not dicks about it. I can see Rob, I can see Sam Seaborn coming back into the fold. Yeah. Um, I mean, we were actually watching the HBO max special and my fiance was like, you know what they should do is reboot it where Sam is the president. And I, I would about... watch that. I would not watch that. <laughs> you would not watch that. I don't want Sam to be the president. <laughs> I don't want Sam to be the president. I just feel like that's 
I feel like and the reason I say I don't want to see that is because when, just by seeing Sterling K. Brown in the Leo role, yeah. you're like, there are so many other interesting actors who could do <laughs> this show right now. Yeah. And Rob Lowe is not among them. <laughs> <laughs> So. Oh, I guess the question is, how do you bring that cat? Like, you know, is Josh Lyman going to still be a chief of staff to somebody? Although I guess, I mean, that's politics. That's kind of how it goes. Yeah. I would like to just sort of see like sort of a new cast and a new West Wing, but sort of still in that Sorkin voice. And maybe it kind of cuts the optimism a bit. <laughs> yeah. Like not, 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 I don't, I don't think it should, should get rid of it entirely. Cause then you just have Veep, but I do yeah. think you need to sort of make it a bit saltier. Give him a close collaborator who's a woman, uh, you know, preferably a woman of color and have them collaborate and put together. Yeah, we, my wife and I were saying, like, who would you like to see, like, be the president in like a rebooted West Wing? And I would be like Viola Davis. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> that'd be, that would be incredible. <laughs> that would be very good. Um, but yeah, so after Sorkin, you know, kind of burns out of the West Wing, um, I think he writes a play called The Farnsworth Invention. I think that came first, uh, which is about like the invention of television, which I've never seen. I have not seen his plays because uh, I do not live in New York City. Um, but he does write a feature film called Charlie Wilson's War. Um, or no, actually, no, first. We, you're forgetting his other show. How did I forget Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip? Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip is sort of the quintessential, like, like it's, yeah, Sorkin can write, but writing isn't just about syntax and fancy speeches. Syntax is about understanding context. Yeah. And I can't think of a, a, of a more mismatched setting than the, the soaring rhetoric of Aaron Sorkin with essentially Saturday Night Live. <laughs> and sort of like, this is an institution. And it's just... It gets away from him so quickly. Yeah. <laughs> so quickly that you're just like, who? Like, I get it. Like, NBC is like, Sorkin's coming back. We got the show, whatever he wants to do. Oh, man, it, it got away from him real. And that <laughs> had, like, has a good cast. And it's just, by the time you're getting near the end of the season where, they're, like, uh, Nate Cordry is like, you know, we're standing in the middle of where legends performed. And his dad's like, your brother's standing in the middle of Afghanistan. And it's like, <laughs> what are we talking about? What is this show? It, uh, so I really like that pilot. I really love Whitford and Matthew Perry together. I think their chemistry is incredible. Um, I wish it were a better show. Although I will admit when it aired, I was really into it. Like I was really, I mean, it's those first few episodes but it did like i remember he was like hiring like other writers to come in and write the sketches because people were criticizing the sketches that were on there saying they weren't funny um and then i think the way he described it is he never felt like he like had his swing like it like the whole time it just didn't feel like he had it but you can feel it kind of trying to slip back into like a west wing towards the end because there's like a huge like five or six episode long arc with the Nick Cordry's brother, like being kidnapped in Afghanistan or something. Um, yeah, what a world. Sarah Paulson played like essentially Kristen Chenoweth. <laughs> yeah. DL was, was on it. Like it was yeah. like, you know, it it was a weird thing. It was, it was a, a weird thing weird, that happened. It, it's a weird, weird show. I don't know. Is it like on Peacock now? Is it like, I, oh, I, I need to check. I, I own the DVDs. I will tell you that. I, I, I bought the do. DVDs. <laughs> I bought them way back when. Uh, and I do think that's the only reason that they let this the season finish was because it was so expensive that NBC mm -hmm. wanted DVDs because there is an entire episode where Matthew Perry, Bradley Whitford and Sarah Paulson do not appear because <laughs> they ran out of money. They're like, you can't use the main cast. And that's the episode where Alice and Janney hosts Studio 60 as herself and Timothy Busfield, who plays the character on Studio 60, has a bunch of scenes with her because it's kind of like West Wing catnip. Um, cause his character and her character on the West wing were great together, yeah. but yeah, there's an entire episode in which the three main stars do not appear cause it was too expensive. <laughs> Yikes. Um, so yeah. So, and what's even funnier is like, I remember that year is studio 60 launched and 30 rock launched and people are like, well, 30 rocks never going to last, but it's going to yeah. be studio 60. That's what I was saying. Yeah, <laughs> me too. And 30 rock, you know, is now like this beloved you know, sitcom of the 2000s. It's an institution. Yeah. And I, uh, like I checked out 30 Rock. I think I watched the first episode and I was like, this is weird. <laughs> like, this is really strange. And you had to like, I, I think, I think people were expecting something different from Tina Fey, but it was like just very silly. I don't it think was. And expecting it to be that silly. If you've ever read like bossy pants, she talks about like, 
they, the network kept trying to make the, trying to like, please make it more normal. And so like, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to make the most normal episode that we can. We're really going to buckle down and, and do this. We're going to make something that is really going to appeal to people. And it's the one where Paul Rubens plays the dying <laughs> Thank you for it, coming to my birthday. Yeah, so that was them trying to be normal. And every, the harder they worked to be normal, the weirder it got. You drink champagne and die. <laughs> That's how the character gets off there. Oh, man. That was the episode that made me fall in love with 30 Rock. Because I, uh, like, and then I got to college that year or, or a year later. My friend had the DVDs, and we were, like, watching them. He just blind bought them. And we got to that one, we were like, oh, okay, we're going to watch this show. So yeah. that's when I fell in love. And then Eric Sorkin obviously has a cameo on 30 Rock later on. And, and they do a pretty... walk and talk and they make fun of Studio 60. <laughs> yes, there's a very good Studio 60 joke. Um, so yeah, Studio 60 did not last past one season. Um, and then Sorkin worked with Mike Nichols on Charlie Wilson's War. Which is, uh, I believe, with... is it Mike Nichols' last film? I think it's his last film after his... It's that or closer. No, closer came in two thousand four, and and Charlie Wilson's War is two thousand seven. I think you're right. I think it might be. Let me see. He died in twenty fourteen. Um, yeah, that was his final film. Yeah, Wilson's and War. I I like Charlie Wilson's War for the most yeah. part. It's not. I keep. It's a film I go into thinking like this should be untouchable, given like. It's Tom Hanks and Julia Roberts and Philip Seymour Hoffman, you know, working with Mike Nichols and Aaron Sorkin. Like, this should be, this should just be, you know, perfect. And the fact that it's, like, pretty good instead of excellent is sort of my takeaway from it. It's like, how dare this only be pretty good? Yeah. Yeah, I, and I mentioned in my ranking of Aaron Sorkin's films, I really think he's only made one bad movie, and that's Malice, and that was no fault of his own. Um and I think I, I like Charlie Wilson's war quite a bit. I think Philip Seymour Hoffman is incredible. Uh, the scene where he yells at John Slattery <laughs> and shatters his glass door is fantastic. And then, and then the scene with him and Tom Hanks where they're going in and where he's going in and out of the room and there's the bug and all that stuff is tons of fun. But yeah, I agree. Like there, and I, so I went digging cause I had heard of the original ending. Um, and I went digging and found these quotes from Sorkin where he just like, is clearly very unhappy that Mike Nichols and Tom Hanks forced them to change the ending. Um, Cause the film was about nine 11, essentially it's a, it's a precursor to nine 11. I mean, it's based on a true story. If you've never seen Charlie Wilson's war, it's based on a true story of this Congressman who kind of covertly was helping arm um, Afghanistani people uh, against the Soviets uh, because the Soviets were, you know, when the cold war were coming in, the U S was not coming in to help them. Um, and so, it's about how we covertly kind of armed these people and then just left them with all the weapons and didn't do any rebuilding or any training or any kind of infrastructure or anything. And then eventually, you know what happened after that? The Bujahideen became Al Qaeda. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so originally the final scene of Charlie Wilson's war was going to be nine 11. It was supposed to be a punchline. And in these quotes I read from Sorkin, he said that he really pushed back on it. Cause he was like, then what is the point of this movie? Because it's a setup with no punchline without that. Uh, cause it ends on kind of a triumphant kind of hopeful note. I mean, there is some, uh, text at the end. That's like, you know, we fucked up the end game. Um, which is like, oh Yeah. So I think it's like kind. It doesn't land as hard as it should, and like yeah. it's enjoyable as it goes along. But then you're kind of like, wait, what? At the end of it, like, yeah. oh, and then this happened. Like, oh, by the way, today oh. we call them computers. By the way, nine <laughs> eleven. <laughs> yes. And apparently, Tom Hanks was uh, very uncomfortable with implying that his character was responsible for nine eleven. Um, I, I I mean, to me, that's a misread of what Sorkin is saying because I don't think Sorkin, that's what is Sorkin saying. said. So I mean, said it's not saying that you were responsible. No, it's saying that in the government, the U.S. Yeah. government was complicit in not following through on a rebuilding process that ultimately like it, it was U.S. policy, not the not not Charlie Wilson caused 9-11. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the last line of that quote was Sorkin said, you know, I got over it. So yeah. he was eventually like, it's fine. It's whatever. But I think that's what makes Charlie Wilson's war towards the kind of like bottom middle of the pack. Yeah. Versus kind of rising above because you're right with Sorkin and Mike Nichols it should be you know incredible yeah but then uh, we get Sorkin and Fincher <laughs> we do get Sorkin and Fincher which is untouchable yes 
which is is the best. The Social Network is to me will will always be one of the defining films of the 21st century. And I think as time has gone on, um, if it has a flaw, it's that it's too nice to Mark Zuckerberg, which and it's not very nice to Mark Zuckerberg. No. Like at the time, they're like, "Oh man, this is really harsh to Mark Zuckerberg." To the point where Sorkin, like when he won his Oscar, he like kind of apologized to Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. He's like, "This is kind of a composite," and you know, the scene within the in the, you know with you know the girlfriend doesn't really exist, you know. And it's like, you don't need to apologize to Mark Zuckerberg because he gave some money to some schools. Like, you don't, like, he's, you know, he's, he has actively made the world a worse place. And we also, yeah. like, you were, and, and Sorkin, like, he said, him also said later on, like, we fact checked this movie within an inch of its life yeah. because we didn't want to get sued. Yeah. Uh, and I think I understand him feeling a little bad because you're this, you know, 40 something man writing about this kid. And it's like, uh, I mean, now we know, like, we see what he also, did. Also, once you make your first billion dollars, you cease to be a kid. I don't care if you're rich, fucking rich. You cease well, to be a child. To me, that's the point of the movie. It's, the, you know, the 21st century is defined by these teenagers and college dropouts who are running the biggest conglomerates and countries in the world. And, you know, not necessarily a lack of immaturity, but they're kids. Like, and, uh, you know, the relationship between Mark and Eduardo, like, is really crushing. It's like, you know, you were my friend, man. Like, I yeah. lost my friend. I mean, that's, to me, the big, dark joke at the end of The Social Network is that our, I mean, and why the film is called The Social Network is that our social relationships are going to be defined by people who couldn't figure out their own social relationships. Yeah. Yeah. That's the joke, you know, that that for some, you know, someone who doesn't have any friends is going to tell you what friendship means yes. and how friendship will operate and, 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 and understanding it in such a cold clinical manner that it, it has no life to it, you know? So for him, like the fact that his Eureka moment is like, ah, I'll add an it's complicated to relationships, <laughs> you know, like it's so, it's so, I, I think the film is, is, has amazing, hilarious dialogue and moments, but it's also a very sad film. It's incredibly sad. Uh, and it's just everything is perfect. Like, and I don't say that about hardly any movies. I don't know if I've said that about another movie, but like the score, the direction, the cinematography, you just think like, just pick out a scene, like any scene, you pick out the scene of Eduardo confronting Mark in the Facebook office when he's just gotten hosed. The shot design, building that tension, that emotional tension to him running, walking down that hallway, running up to Mark, the score from Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross that's going on there, the precise dialogue, the cut in from Sean from the side, like everything is building and working and executed perfectly. It just, blows my mind that voters were like the king's speech <laughs> <laughs> this is good but have you seen that the king of england gave a speech <laughs> yeah vote oscar voters i think again that's also a product of what the, the academy was at the time yeah like in 2010 it was old and white and like i don't for them it's like oh it's a facebook movie and meanwhile you have like harvey weinstein being like hey look over here <laughs> I imagine he talks in the most disgusting way possible. <laughs> yeah, I think if the social network were released today, it would win Best Picture probably. Yeah, um, but honestly, and you know, I don't hate the King speech. I just feel like it's clear that the social network is the more powerful, more influential, more lasting, and, and more important film. I think time has proven that out without question. Yeah. Like we're still talking about the social network, and I do like. <sighs> I don't know. I've been dubious in the past of like a sequel talk, but the, to hear Sorkin tell it that he's talked to Fincher about it. He had a sit down meeting with these uh, executives who have since left Facebook and are now like talking about like what's been going on there. Like he had a full on. I can't remember her name, but he had a full on meeting with this really high up executive, which tells me that there's potential there. Um, I mean, there's definitely a story to tell. For, yeah. I mean, there's a story to tell. Because we've, we're now 10 years removed from the social network. So much has changed. I mean, you if you wanted to make just a story about Cambridge Analytica yeah. and use that as, like, your framework, you'd have something there. Like, you don't have to be, like, and here's every, like, or you could be, like, the genocide in Myanmar. Like, there's so many things that Facebook has done wrong mm -hmm. that basically, um, you know, he, he's he's a kid with his dad's gun. Like, he has this immense power and has no idea how to wield it. <laughs> He's Jacob Tremblay in The Predator. <laughs> exactly. 
uh, just blowing up houses <laughs> with the alien gun. Uh -oh. I was like, where did that, the kid with who found his dad gun? It's like, it's always Jurassic Park. <laughs> That's, yeah. I was like, where did that line come from? I didn't make it up. Um, <laughs> so it's Jurassic Park. Uh, so yeah, social network is amazing. Um, yeah. I'm still, we'll, we'll get to it, but I'm still a little annoyed that, that Fincher and Fincher did not direct Steve Jobs. Yes, we will <laughs> get to that. But we'll first get we get to Moneyball, which I think is supremely unknown. And what year was Moneyball? 2011. So it was the year after social network. Okay. And this is the second of two films, so after Malice, that... So Moneyball is fascinating, and I yes. want to talk to Steven talk to, about that. Yeah, explain, explain to our listeners what happened with Moneyball. So Moneyball, if you have or have not seen the story, it's about Billy Bean, general manager of the Oakland Athletics, who embraces sabermetrics, uh, this kind of controversial way of choosing players and playing players based on statistics and, like, hits and runs and, and stuff like that versus using intuition or, you know, what uh, they've been using for 100 years. Uh, so Steven Soderbergh was supposed to direct this with Brad Pitt starring in it. The Friday before filming was supposed to start on a Monday, Soderbergh turned in a new draft of the script that he had worked on that included like documentary footage. They were going to shoot new, uh, like new documentary footage with like actual players who were involved. It was much funnier. It was kind of a comedy. It was supposed to be. And I think uh, if you've seen um, High Flying Bird, High Flying Bird. Yes. And I think a little bit of what's the the laundromat, a little bit of that. It was supposed to be kind of like a hybrid film, kind of like okay. the laundromat has people talking directly, breaking the fourth wall, stuff like that. So to return that script in Amy Pascal at Sony said, hell no, uh, and shut it down, fired him off the film. Um, and so it was, you know, it, it was put back into development and Steven Zalian was brought in to work on the script who wrote Schindler's List, a uh, bunch of other stuff, uh, and, and to continue to develop it. And Britt Bennett Miller was hired to direct it. At that point, Bennett Miller, Miller had directed Capote, was coming off of that. I don't know exactly when Sorkin got involved. I think it was probably because of Social Network, because Sony was making both movies and they asked him to take a crack at it. And he said he'd do it on one condition if Steven Zalian had like gave him his blessing and he said yes. So Sorkin came in to do some punch ups, some like dialogue, some some polishes, but ended up getting a, a screenwriting credit alongside Zalian. And the way they did it was they didn't work together. Zalian would turn in his script, it would then go to Sorkin, he would work on it, he would turn it in, then it would go to Zalian. So it was kind of they weren't handing it back and forth to each other, they were handing it to the studio or the director, and it was kind of going through there. And it's, it's this really perfect blend because I think it's it, there's unmistakably Sorkin stuff in it. There are scenes that are very Sorkin-esque. There's some really good jokes, really good lines in it. Um, but you've also got kind of that Steven Zalian kind of quiet and attention to character and, and uh, really kind of precise character driven stuff that plays out throughout the cross throughout across the film. Yeah, uh, it's a film that can get kind of melancholy. You yeah. know, in a, in a moment and not it doesn't feel odd. It just it can get really melancholy. And then you'll have like, you know, a scene where like Billy Bean is like bouncing off his his, uh, you know, scouts. It's like if you'd say because <laughs> he gets on base, you know, like <laughs> like that sort of very punchy well, dialogue. Point you speak. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, yeah. I'm going to point to Pete. <laughs> <laughs> And I think Pitt is so good in that movie. Uh, and it's also got this really lovely father daughter story. And I don't know. I just uh, I found it really moving. Like I rewatched it for this ranking and I was I was really moved by it and moved by, I don't know, this idea that like, you know, you could read it as superstition that Billy Bean doesn't show up to the games. But to me, it's it's kind of like he doesn't feel like he deserves there. Like he had his shot and he whiffed it and he's been struggling and struggling to get anyone to just tell him that he's great or tell him that he's doing a good job or tell him that he's good at what he's doing. And it's hard for him to believe in himself um, or believe that he, you know, belongs there. Uh, well, and it's such, you know, and it's based off the book by Michael Lewis of the same name and mm -hmm. sort of the, the arc that you can sort of see in Billy Bean's story is that like Billy Bean was according to the scouts supposed to be a great player. Yeah. He passed the eyeball test, but when he got into the game, he couldn't perform. And in a weird way, this is sort of his revenge on the scouts that told him he would be great to sort of blow it all up. And yet I think the, the film is so great. And I think it's one of the best sports films of all time because it understands that sort of unique allure where we 
both want to remove the romanticism from baseball because that way we can't be hurt, but it's impossible. And not just baseball, any sport. I mean, sports, you know, engender that romanticism because they're these sort of athletic feats whose outcomes are unknown. And, you know, sabermetrics is supposed to be this way of like, we can sort of, you know, we, we're, you know, we're counting cards at the table. We have the answers, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the conflict is, is Billy Bean going to give himself over to the romanticism for a game that he clearly loves? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I do. I, I feel like it's super underrated. It's on Netflix right now. So I highly suggest. Yeah. I mean, it's, and it's been in Netflix's top 10 for a little bit now. So yeah. people are watching it, which is great because I think it's, um, I definitely think it's a, a fantastic film. Um, uh, Bennett Miller three for three on best director nomination. Yeah. Yeah. And then he just goes back into the wilderness and lives out of a backpack. I saw that. That's literally what he does. I know. I saw that interview. He was like, I don't have a house. I just live out of my backpack. (laughs) Like, all right. All right. Three time Oscar nominee. Yeah. Uh, And then Sorkin goes to HBO to make his triumphant return to television with The Newsroom, Um, which I think was flawed from the get go. Its central premise is flawed. And that it, it's trying to be about current events and current news, but it's a serialized television show. So it's airing, you know, nine to 13 months after these events happened. It really. So first off, I don't think the premise is necessarily flawed in the sense of like, ooh, like Aaron Sorkin making a journalism story is a much smarter thing than Aaron Sorkin making a SNL story. Yeah. Because. Journalism is an institution. It's it's the it's the fourth estate. You know, there's really something where he can sink his teeth into. But like you said, this decision to be like, well, I'm going to make it about current events. It just always reads to me. Especially the first season, I couldn't get past the first season. I grinded it out. But the first season all reads to me. It's like, get a blog, Aaron Sorkin. <laughs> like I have thoughts on the day's events. Great, get a blog. You know, but he's like, no, I'm going to make a TV show so that like when. Bin Laden has announced that we killed Bin Laden. I can talk about that. <laughs> yeah, I watched all of it. Um, and I will say it improved in its third season. I did actually like season three. Um, I'm trying to remember who. Was, I mean, the cast was really good. I mean, you had Stacked, Jeff Daniels. I mean, Aaron Sorkin has no problem putting together talent. You have Allison Pill, John Gallagher Jr., I th- Dev Patel, I think, was in it. Dev um, Patel. I mean, Jeff Daniels was the lead. Um, and then, oh gosh, she has hollow bones. Emily Mortimer. <laughs> Emily Mortimer. Yeah. She Allison doesn't Pill. have hollow bones, but her character on 30 Rocket, hollow bones. John Gallagher Jr., Sam Watterson, Jane Fonda was on there quite frequently. Um, and then he brought in, I can't remember if it was season two or season three, but Paul Lieberstein, uh, who ran the office after Greg Daniels left. Uh, to like work on the show because Aaron Sorkin's a huge fan of The Office. Um, and I don't know. I I I think it improved in season three, but it was just some of the most cringeworthy stuff. But even me, like the most ardent Aaron Sorkin supporter, <laughs> was just like, oh, it's all of it. Like again, his flaws kind of come to the surface. Like yeah. the thing about Aaron Sorkin is like when you see his flaws, they are not hidden. Yeah, and it's very again very paternalistic, very like women meh, in the workplace. Like, how do I humanize a woman character? Maybe she'll be clumsy, and like that's it. <laughs> and then it's like, but thankfully a man is gonna come along to tell her what's what. Yeah, you know? and she'll be impressed. And so like it's just, yeah, it the newsroom could not make it past the first season. And then like it, you know, like somebody with something to prove, he turns out uh, I think his second best script he's ever written, which is Steve Jobs. Yeah. Steve is, Jobs is very good. Steve Jobs is I mean, it's like it's an ingenious conceit to sort yes. of be like three it's three scenes. Mhm. And I love it. I mean, I know Fincher was initially like flirting with it and Sony didn't want to deal with his bullshit. Um, <laughs> after, <laughs> after Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Essentially, yeah. And I, he, they didn't want, he wanted con- complete control over marketing and he said, this is the budget. And they were like, ah, the budget's 10 million less. And he's like, nope, the budget is this. And, you know, when they wouldn't buy Thanks, I've done Alien 3 and the budget is this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, I know what the budget is. Uh, and his budgets are high because of the time he yeah. takes uh, on stuff. But I don't know. I, you know, I've seen, seen, seen Steve Jobs a number of times now, and it's improved upon each viewing. And I, I, I'm now to the point where I really dig what Danny Boyle did. I, mm. I like that he shot, you know, the first act in 16 millimeter, second act in 35 millimeter, third act digitally. Um, 
I don't know. I, I like visually what it did. And, and the rhythm of the entire piece is just, you can't, like, I put it on and my fiance had seen it and she wasn't going to watch it with me. But like, she was like in the kitchen and then like was standing and watching and then like moved over here and then sat down and then watched the whole thing. Because yeah. it just like, it doesn't ever like let up. It's just always compelling. And I think who better to try and encapsulate a man like Steve Jobs and Aaron Sorkin, because you have in Steve Jobs, this guy who is thinking kind of like Zuckerberg for different thoughts at the same time. And yeah. so he's and dealing exceedingly with this arrogant that. about it. Yes. Terrible about it. A really bad person. Um, I don't know. I think it's wrapped up in that, that line that Seth Rogen says, where it's not binary. You can be decent and mm -hmm. a genius at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I think that whole, I mean, I, I will always sort of be curious, like, what Christian Bale would have done, because I know, I think that's who Fincher wanted. Yeah. Um, but I Leo, think Leo was interested in it, but then apparently Steve Jobs' widow was, like, leaning on people to get them to not be part of this movie. Oh, all right. Sure. Oh. <laughs> um, I think Fassbender is really good. Um, yeah, but I also think, I think like, Kate great. Winslet's really good. Rogan's really good. Michael Stuhlbarg's really good. So... Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely enjoy Steve Jobs a lot. I think that uh, I interviewed Danny Boyle for, I think it was Train Spotting 2, um, and we kind of talked a bit about, like, why did he think it kind of flopped? And it was just sort of one of those things where, um, in terms of the rollout, you know, it's not that the film was bad. And I don't think the film is bad at all. Um, but I don't think, I think Universal kind of underestimated how much people wanted to see a Steve Jobs movie, and they didn't take the time to really build word of mouth and buzz on it. Like they should have given it like a very slow release and they gave it like a, like a one weekend limited release. And then they're like, everyone can see it now. And then everyone's yeah. like, no, we're good. <laughs> well, there was also confusion because there was the Ashton Kutcher, Josh yeah. Gad one. Yes. And so people were like, is this the same? Or are they just making it like they, I don't think they pushed the whole, like, no, this is like Aaron Sorkin who did the social network. And this is Danny Boyle. And like, this is a very big deal that you should be excited. That about. is the, you have seen the bargain basement VOD version. Let yeah. us show you the prestige version. And I don't think I still get when I tell people I like Steve Jobs, they're like, oh, really? Or like, I didn't see it because I was like, eh, why would you watch a movie about Steve Jobs? Like, and I saw Pirates of Silicon Valley or whatever, you know, it's like, well, yeah. it's not, it's not the same thing. It's and I think same. it's just this brilliant way of encapsulating a man's life. I mean, none of these things happen exactly as they happen in the film, but to stage them at these events and to mm -hmm. to make it organic and that it feels like something that could have happened. And you also get a pretty complete picture of what made this guy tick and his endless contradictions. Yeah. I mean, who does that? Who says that's not my daughter? <laughs> who does that <laughs> for years after a paternity test? And he's like, no, not my kid. Just this walking contradiction. Yeah. Yeah, I also feel like, I mean, to me, again, Steve Jobs, it's one of the reasons it's appealing is because it eschews not just the bio, biopic form, but also the, um, the, the, the character. Like, there's not really a, I wouldn't say, like, his heroic thing is, is like, oh, I guess I will accept my daughter. <laughs> yeah. I will accept that I have a child. And, like, that's the resolution. <laughs> He's not a good guy, you know? Yeah. And so, like, are you going to, like do people want to see a film about a bastard? And I would say like, if the bastard's interesting enough. Yeah. Yeah. And Sorkin, I mean, it's based on the Walter Isaacson biography, but Sorkin himself did interviews and the key interview he did was with Steve Jobs' daughter. So I think this is something else people kind of take for granted is that when putting together these scripts, Sorkin actually talked to these people mm -hmm. um, or who he could with social network. So many people were under NDAs that they couldn't legally. Yeah, that one draws heavily from The Accidental Billionaires, which is mm -hmm. Ben Mesrick's book. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. Okay, so what comes after Steve? Then Jobs? we get Molly's Game. We get uh, his directorial game. debut, which is good until it's not, but still is overall pretty fun. I remember when we saw that at TIFF, we were, someone told us that like, it was on the verge of being a disaster and they saved it in the editing room. <laughs> yeah. Which I, is strange to me because his scripts are so tight. You know, meticulous. Yeah. But you can see how the film is sort of like, it jumps around a lot and sort yeah. of has sort of these, you know, but I think it works for the most part until you get to that scene where like Kevin Costner is like, I'm just going to explain your psychosis to you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> let, yeah. the, let the dad explain to his daughter what her problem with him is. 
Yeah, it's just it's it's a bad, clumsy, rushed scene that is also really unnecessary because it comes on the heels of the scene where Idris Elba is defending her mm-hmm. to the agents. And so like that scene has basically accomplished what you are setting out to do. You know, it's just it's a bad scene and it shouldn't be in the film. Yeah. Um, but it is. And but Molly's game on the whole is is still like, I mean, it's got fun dialogue. It's an interesting story. It's really fun when you know that Michael Sarah's character is based on Toby Maguire. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is a super fun part of it. Uh, it's got Jeremy Strong. Yeah, Jeremy Strong. Yes. Uh, being angry about bagels. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, it's a good, it's a good film. Um, flawed, but still, I'd say worth checking out. Like if it was streaming, I'd be like, you know, give it a go. Yeah. And also is like, it's not like, oh, Sorkin should not direct. Like Sorkin's a really bad director. It's like, oh, it's, it's a serviceable job. Yeah, yeah, he's fine. Which I guess let's, I mean, now we've been talking for like an hour. For <laughs> brings us to, up to bring us to his latest one, Trial of the Chicago 7. Yes. Um, and the, the reaction to it has been mixed. Um, and I'm not really surprised. Because to me, the central conflict between Sorkin telling this story is that, as I said earlier in the show, uh, he's an institutionalist. He believes that institutions are inherently good. It's just, it's bad actors. But that kind of puts him at odd at a story about revolutionaries. Like, that's what these protesters are want. They want a revolution in the way, you know, they wanted to stop the Vietnam War. They wanted to sort of upend the system and, like, fight back against it. And they were railroaded by an institution, by the U.S. government and by the judiciary, by the courts. Um, So the film kind of awkwardly sits in there. And I think for Sorkin, he's I think he's doing his best. I think he's sort of like, I don't want to ignore the Bobby Seal of it all. But at the same time, like, am I the right guy to tell the Bobby Seal story? You know, the story of a co-founder of the Black Panther who was bound and gagged in the middle of a courtroom for, you know, for something he should not have even been on trial for. Mm -hmm. And Sorkin's solution is sort of like to kind of split the difference and sort of acknowledge like, we are with you, Bobby Seal, but also we're going to act like this only happened one day and not four weeks. Like it did in real life. Like it's very, like that trial went on forever. It's a tough story to tell. Yeah. Um, I think Sorkin does his, he does a all right job with it. Um, I think he's got good actors at his disposal. Um, and I think his main me- his main message about how protest is inherently messy is is actually worthwhile. Now, you know, tell me um, when when was the script first sort of heading into development? Two thousand seven. Two thousand seven. Two thousand eight. So okay. back when we were talking about Charlie Wilson's War, um, was when he was working on the script because yeah. it was Steven Spielberg sparked the story and asked Aaron Sorkin to write a script on it, and he wrote it. And Spielberg was going to make it with Sasha Baron Cohen and Will Smith and a number of other people. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I can't remember what uh, there was a writer strike, and then Spielberg moved into I don't know if it was Lincoln or something else. Moved on. Yeah, he moved on, and so the script kind of lingered for a while. Um, and Sorkin says he hasn't changed much since then. And in the interviews I've seen, was very adamant that this not be a period piece, like this be a story about today, mm-hmm. about uh what's happening and that's the aspect that i really liked about it was was it's about the power of protest and the the different kinds of protest that that have power and the fact that most kinds of protests are valid so the like you said there's that internal struggle of like well my way of pushing forward progressive politics is more effective than your way of pushing forward progressive politics i think that's a really fascinating discussion amongst these defendants um and then obviously you have not only like the system is not working the way it should, but the executive branch is pushing, is using the judicial branch to um, get back at its enemies. Yeah, right. to stamp, to essentially stamp out protest. I mean, yes, the, these, 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 these people were essentially, I would say, I mean, some were basically picked at random, yeah. but they were like, they chose visible protesters and we're like these these people will pay for the crimes of all protesters and serve as a warning 
Um, but also it was like kind of like a petty fuck you, like because the new attorney general didn't like the old attorney general. And so like, again, these people have to suffer. Like it's so, it's so weird, but um, I think it's, I still think it's a worthwhile story. I get yeah. that. Like I, I, the thing is, is I understand like people who have an issue with trial of Chicago seven. Like I don't, I get where they're coming from, but I don't, I think it's contradictions make it interesting. Even if I also think they are, somewhat flawed could someone else have told this story better yeah but i mean i don't once you start going down that line like okay well tell me who and tell me how and tell me what because this is a big complex story with a lot of moving parts and at the end of the day like this is the one that we got so i think it's i think it's worthwhile and i think it's worth checking out yeah i mean there are a lot of different kinds of films that have been made about the 60s about the 70s about protest movements about uh you know abuse of power I think this is just another one. Uh, And yeah, I think it's worthwhile. And I think it's, I think it does a pretty good job of drawing a a pretty clear line from then to now. I also really like the performances. I like Mark Rylance a lot. Um, I think that Frank Langella is infuriating. Uh, He's kind of like, I don't know. I feel like people aren't talking about him a lot, but I feel like his role is a little undervalued because you just kind of buy into the fact that he is that mean. But I think that's a little harder to pull off the kind of nuance and like the insidiousness of what he's doing uh, on that trial, I think is it's impressive how he pulled that together. But I think Yahya Abdul-Mateen the second is, is also a, a pretty clear standout amongst that cast. But yeah, how do you, I mean, yeah, like Bobby seal was bound and gagged for days, but clearly Sorkin is compressing the timeline entirely in this yeah, trial. It's not a documentary. It's not yeah. a book, you know, I mean, and that material exists. Um, but I'm sort of, I think Sorgan, you know, is at the, at the end of the day, you have to sort of, sort of look at Sorgan's strengths and his limitations. And I think Child of Chicago 7 shows both, yeah. you know, it's got really fast dialogue. It's got, you know, it's paced very well. Um, it's got some, it's, 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 it's about something real. It's interesting, but you know, he is at the end of the day, he's sort of like, he is very much, I think if you were to like put him on the political spectrum. He's kind of an establishment Democrat. Yeah. You know, he leans progressive, but he's not, you're not going to see Aaron Sorkin out here being like defund the police. You know, you're not going to see him being like, we need Medicare for all. Like, that's just not who he is. Like, I remember there was like a, a writer's round table and this was our, I, I forget what the issue was, but I remember very clearly Aaron Sorkin being like, I don't understand why writers need a union. I mean, I have my agent and they represent me and that's all we get. And it's like, he just didn't understand, like not everyone has the same level of power <laughs> and that unions are inherently good because they argue on behalf of workers who, when they band together, have collective bargaining power that they would not otherwise have. And again, I don't think Sorkin would describe himself as an anti-union guy, but he, you know, in his particular terms, he's like, I just don't understand why we need a union, you know? And so it's those kind of things. Like I, yeah. I, I sort of acknowledge his political and personal limitations. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That being said, I mean, the, the material, the new material he wrote for that West Wing special, I think was spot on mm-hmm. the, the little interstitials of the, the performers kind of explaining different aspects of the selection and everything. Um, yeah. So I don't know. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, I mean, again, it's very easy to rag on Aaron Sorkin. And I mean, I mean, people definitely had a field day on Twitter a few weeks ago when he was like, here's how I'd write the end of the Trump presidency. And then all the Republicans would come to the Trump and be like, it's time to go. And it's like, but like at the end of the day, like Aaron Sorkin's a romantic. Yeah. He is, if you're looking for like, who is the predecessor to Aaron Sorkin, it's probably like Frank Capra. And yeah. Frank Capra did not always have clear political ideas. He had some sort of kind of fuzzy notion of like, I'm a little worried about the mob and I like the independent man, but like, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, I believe in the goodness of Americans and the community. Like it's all kind of blurs together a bit. And that's sort of Sorkin as well. Yeah, I'd agree with that. So, yeah. Uh, Anything else to add? I mean, I think he's a fine director. I also think it makes sense that he's directing. If you look at any kind of behind the scenes footage or set photos from like Steve Jobs or Social Network, like he's always right there. So I think for some directors that would get really annoying, but he's coaching on like exactly how to hit each line and like how fast it should be. Which I'm sure actors love. (laughs) Well, he tells this story about, so the Social Network 
the script was like 180 something pages and Fincher was like, how long do you think this movie is? He's like, maybe I think it, and Sorkin was like, it's two hours. And he said, well, show me. And Fincher sat there with a stopwatch and had Sorkin read out the entire script and started and stopped on you know each scene. And then when Fincher got the actors together, they were shooting that opening scene, which was one of the first scenes they shot. And after the first take, Fincher said, it's good. Um, He was like, but this scene is seven minutes and eight seconds. And you guys are you guys are at seven minutes and 42 seconds. And Sorkin was like, which I'm sure the actors loved. (laughs) But like there is a very like his scripts are meant to be very, very fast. And it takes, you know, you got to get in in that rhythm step. (laughs) I mean, it's that notion, like because his characters speak fast and intelligently, like they are therefore intelligent. Because they don't stutter, they don't say, um... I know who you're talking very, about. Very, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> they must be intelligent. Clearly, they're go. very smart. We won't go there. All right, let's get into <laughs> where we should go is to recently watched. What have you yes. seen lately? Um, so, you know, we didn't have TIFF this year, and the big opening night film of TIFF was David Byrne's American Utopia, uh, which is now on HBO Max. And... Uh, we were watching something else on like on last Saturday and flipped HBO and it was on and I caught a couple songs and I was like, this looks really good. And so I got up on Sunday morning and I made my coffee and I sat down and put it on and was just profoundly moved. Um, Spike Lee directed it's a concert documentary, essentially, but it's uh, it's a film version of this Broadway show uh, in which David Byrne and this band that he's put together and the entire everyone's wearing suits and no shoes and all the instruments are strapped to the band members so they can move around. So it's kind of a performance art piece, but they they perform songs by the Talking Heads. They perform a song by Janelle Monet. Um, and it's about. It's about trying to be. Or it's about being optimistic and hopeful in the face of abject terror. And the reason to be optimistic and hopeful is that we are still humans and we are therefore together. And the way that Spike Lee puts it all together is just really like, I got super emotional watching it because it's, it's how Spike Lee saw this and he's using, it's hard to describe, but the way you see like the band members move amongst the stage, it, it really is just profoundly uh, emotional um, and like making this human connection and, and Spike Lee makes the audience part of the film. So in a lot of these concert documentaries, you don't really see the audience, but the audience interaction with David Byrne and, and them getting up and dancing and clapping and singing along is part of the whole thing. Uh, I don't know. I was just really blown away by it and I haven't stopped thinking about it. And I highly suggest anyone, uh, remotely interested, check it out on, uh, HBO max and turn the sound up. Um, I'm a fan of Talking Heads. I don't know if it works if you're not a fan of Talking Heads, but uh, I don't know. I loved it. I'm looking forward to watching it. I mean, I recently watched Stop Making Sense, so yeah, um, I'm eager to sort of see this. Uh, for me, I recently watched Willow. I had never seen Ron Howard's Willow before. Um, and it came out in 1988 uh, and stars Warwick Davis, uh, in this sort of fantasy thing, he finds a baby on the river, very Moses-like, and has to take the baby uh, who has been destined to bring down the evil queen. He has to bring her, has to bring the baby one place. And first he thinks, oh, I'll just drop it off with a, with a, a human or not a human. Like they have different races. And like he's from a race of like little people. And like, and he's like, but then there's the, I think it's the Daikini. It's like, I'll drop it off with the Daikini because that's the baby's people. And he ends up going on this adventure and it's very heavily influenced by like Lord of the Rings and like the Moses story and, and things like that. But you know, it doesn't try to hide those influences. And I was very charmed by it. I mean, it's, it's got a couple pacing issues. Um, it get you know, it takes some big swings, but for the most part, I thought it was very charming uh, for what it is. I can see why like, like a fantasy, an eighties fantasy film, like the princess bride was more, widely accepted and has made a bigger cultural impact but i can also sort of see like oh well of course they're going to give willow a sequel series because it, it clearly has its followers and um it's good for what it is and um i i was i was mostly uh taken in by it I, even though it has val kilmer as sort of like the hero willow is the name of the main character played by warwick davis and i think warwick davis is really good in the lead role in the film i think he's very charming and you know you really root for him i think he's the heart of the film um, and so it's on Disney Plus. So if you want to give Willow a shot, check it out. 
I've never seen Willow, so maybe yeah. I'll watch it. It's one now. I, there are, now I'm getting to the point where there's only like a handful of Ron Howard movies I haven't seen. Like I haven't seen. I tried watching Splash one time and I couldn't get through it. But I <laughs> guess I have to give that another shot. Uh, I haven't seen The Dilemma. I haven't seen Cocoon. Um, the Dilemma. And I think that's. And then, and then there's like his '70s films. Like I haven't seen um, Grand Theft Auto. You know, like I, you know. But for the most part, I've seen most of the Ron Howard movies. Yeah, I still need to see the paper. That's the one that everyone loves. I need. To I know. Watch. I really want to see the paper. So I, I might just it. rent it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all so much for listening. If you want to keep up with this podcast, you should follow us on Twitter. Adam, where can we find you on Twitter? And Adam Chipko. And you can find me at Matt Bolton. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll be back with you next week.